Hello and welcome to another episode of the Midi Hour Meets podcast where we speak to a wide range of people from the music world. On the show this time we're speaking to Laka, who are an amazing electronic duo from Dublin. Uh, Ian and Dara have been together since 2003. Uh, they've been signed to RNS Records for many years. They've had their tracks played by huge artists. Um, they do their own AV shows and they were involved in a really interesting documentary with the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision, which I thoroughly recommend you check out. Um, you can donate to the podcast if you like. I do do this all by myself from my bedroom. Uh, I do the editing, the organisation, the promotion, the production, the graphic design, everything by myself. So anything that you can donate back is gratefully received. But let's get on with the show. And the first question I asked the guys was about their musical beginnings. What immediately comes into my mind is like just my parents' music collection and like records playing in the sitting room. Namely, like Rod Stewart is one that comes to mind. <laughs> wow. The synth lines in Do You Think I'm Sexy? Like, this is a really <laughs> strong and vivid and, and uh, happy memory for me of like music and being really like, wow, what is this? Yeah, I mean, uh, probably the same with me for just my, my dad's early record collection. My dad uh, used to listen to like Jimi Hendrix and kind of old rock and stuff like that. And then also my mom used to listen to um, like Sting and stuff like that. But I also remember then she had this one, uh, Laurie Anderson, uh, the old Superman thing. And I just remember like that was one of the first things that I was like, whoa, that is really different to all the other stuff that they play. It's like really odd. And then years ago, uh, we were playing at Rewire Festival and I got to meet her. Wow. <laughs> and I was, so, I was so starstruck. I just said, my mom, my mom likes your music. <laughs> and, and, then, and then I just stood there for a second. But I had just seen her performance and it was amazing. And she, like, she totally blew me away. But then I, I untied my tongue and, uh, you know, uh, I had a little nice chat to her. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so that was kind of one of those really nice moments where like pretty much one of the first influences you, you get to like you get to perform at the same festival at them and that was a really nice moment yeah they're really yeah, nice that must be amazing moments. when it comes full circle yeah yeah. Mm. yeah um and yeah what a weird record that oh superman was uh, i remember sort of being scared of that record when i was a kid <laughs> yeah yeah it, it had uh, and also like super um very uh, innovative as well. I mean, I think there was like tape used on the bow of the violin and like loads of loads of kind of techniques really pushed out there, you know, um, like, yeah, lo loads of really cutting edge techniques used on it, uh, but also kind of had this like very narrative, narrative uh, kind of thing with, with humor as well. And when, when I saw her play at, at Rewire Festival, it was her show was really amazing in terms of uh, yeah, there was a real narrative quality that I kind of like, you know, she, she does some kind of spoken parts, some music parts, and it really is like a beautiful story and a journey. And also, yeah, with a bit of humor where you think she's talking about one thing and then suddenly she kind of, you realize she's talking about something else and flips it and stuff. So yeah, cool. really inspiring stuff. I, I was just going to say, I really like Sorry. that feeling of, of being scared by music that you said um, <laughs> when you're like, oh. Because it's like you're, you're kind of repelled and attracted at the same time. Absolutely. Definitely that. Like, I wanted to hear it more, but it's really yeah. scared me. Like, the vocoder was just too weird. <laughs> like, I didn't know if it was... It was like that uncanny valley. It's like that uncanny valley thing, isn't it? It's like... Yeah. Yeah. It was just... I couldn't... Was it a human? Is it a human? Is it a robot? <laughs> like... The first record that happened for me was uh, Charlie by The Prodigy. <laughs> I remember hearing that when I was 11 years old and had the same same reaction. I was like really scared but really intrigued and I used to dare myself to listen to it in the dark with the lights off just on like and <laughs> headphones in my little bedroom <laughs> <laughs> but it had that quality as well yeah like, what a track so weird I don't, I've never experienced anything like this sound but I really want to get into it but I'm also scared if it hasn't happened recently I would like to I would like that to happen again yeah I mean let's go back to the Charlie in a second um I think Hacks and Cloak for me is probably the closest mm. or I guess or Tekka in some ways um genuinely yeah. feel a bit scared you know like <laughs> you know uh especially when they play in the dark <laughs> yeah uh, yeah that's really cool i like that a lot and uh, the, mm -hmm. the autograph album xi had that 
quality. Not that I was scared, but it's kind of overwhelmed. It's it's so dense. I just was like, this is so. Not that I don't like it, but it was kind of a difficult listen, a challenging listen, and it was kind of overwhelming. Yeah, one other, another one for the, for me was uh, Yves Tamor as well. When I saw him play live, uh, that was like that was the last time recently that I was kind of like scared by something, but <laughs> also because uh, I everything everything else at the festival I was I was at was a real was a very sit down experience and and kind of you know like I, I had heard that he'd released a very kind of ambient album as the last thing so i was kind of expecting some kind of you know just a little light chin stroking <laughs> kind of ambience and then suddenly this guy gets up and just starts like roaring and like it was amazing and then people are getting out of their seats and then he's climbing into the thing he's climbing into the audience and it was just it was just like you know I suppose in some ways what he was doing wasn't that shocking, but it was like really the kind of the idea of breaking the fourth wall, you know, yeah. <laughs> especially in, you know, because it, it was, you know, when everything else is kind of seated and especially in a seated place, um, then to have somebody really kind of come out. And then by the end of it, loads of us were up on stage and somebody was carrying him around on his shoulders <laughs> and it just kind of like brought, it brought a punk gig into a seated kind of place and that was like the last time yeah the, you know it, it was kind of yeah it was nerve-wracking uh i i felt very awkward i didn't know what to do i kind of got up on stage and then just kind of moved around for a bit and then but it was great and by the end it was just like so you know everyone kind of felt like they'd been through uh you know a euphoric and slightly traumatic event together and yeah it was brilliant it brought you together nice nice yeah, I think that's such an interesting point about breaking down the fourth wall because there are so many conventions to performances and, and, you know, certain social gatherings that, yeah, when people do break, you know, they just do something way out. Um, yeah, pr maybe your instinctive reaction is like, oh, no, oh, no, this is wrong now. <laughs> this can't happen. But, yeah, like the excitement and journey you go on. Um, I remember being in going to a theatre production. I lived in Brazil for a little while and they had this ball that was getting bigger and bigger in this theatre production. Uh, like this, these people were dancing around it with masks and they kept disappearing behind this ball, coming around with a different mask on. But the ball got bigger and bigger. And then the ball just started coming into the audience. It was this giant, <laughs> fucking huge ball. And it was like in our faces. And everyone was like, what the fuck do we do now? Um, just superb. It totally changed my the way I looked at theatre after that, I think. Yeah, super challenging when that stuff happens. Yeah, exactly. And also electronic music can can struggle a bit with with the performance side of it so i think it's really nice when yeah when when kind of people when people break that uh break out of that scene you know i suppose kind of dan deacon was like one of the first people i kind of saw doing it as well in a kind of he, he takes a different approach it's kind of much more fun play sort of thing but yeah it's interesting when people kind of yeah bring performance bring bring performance to um to electronic music Definitely, definitely. Um, when did you guys start, um, Ian, maybe for you first, when did you start sort of experimenting making music or playing music? Um, it's it's always been there. Like my very first experiment with music would be when I was a, like a small child making uh, cassette tapes just with my mouth, like making mouth sounds. Um, I wish I still had the cassette, but I don't know where it is. But when I was maybe like eight, nine years old um, and I got really into like, I suppose like heavy metal or metal music. I can't even remember what bands I would have been into, but it was very sort of like a, my an early, early kind of uh, attachment to a type of music. So I used to make these songs, doing all the metal sounds with my mouth, doing the distorted guitar sounds and then singing, not not even like multi-tracking, just kind of doing them all at once, like J -j 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 -j, Angel of Death. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that would have been my very first experiment. That's cool, though. man. Even at an early age, I wanted to like record sound and get it down and make make tracks, even though I, I had no other way other than like a tiny little sort of play recorder that I could hit <laughs> hit record on and with tapes. Um, so it's always been there. I could play piano as a kid, but then I suppose more seriously, late teens got into making tracks again. And it was actually probably it was in meeting Dara when I was like probably like, we met we were, we were both about eighteen, and Dara like I wanted to make electronic music. I'd been you know, listening to it for years and, and, and fell in love with it completely. But Dara actually had equipment to make it. And and so we kind of got together then and started making tracks with a couple of other friends in a band first. And then it just became the two of us later on. Uh, so that would have been, yeah, around 98 or so. Yeah. 
and it's just been continuous nice. continuous since and then what were you making music with uh, Dara will be able to tell you the gear <laughs> <laughs> um yeah geez i can't uh i had yeah it was an all hardware based studio based around probably an akai s i had an s s01 maybe first like with eight seconds or something you know so like a really old sampler then i moved to an s3000 maybe and an s3000 xl i can't remember what what the the samplers i had and then i maybe had a dx27 and a base station and a few other bits and bobs you know but yeah, I suppose for me, yeah, the first thing was kind of just with tape, speeding up tape loops myself and my friend had just hit things with sticks, probably like Ian as well. Just trying to, you know, just trying anything. When you, I suppose it's not as easy to find how, how to make things. So you just kind of think maybe this is it. I remember when we were trying to figure out how myself and my friend, we had heard like ultrasonic or someone like that. And we were trying to figure out how they did it. And so we, his dad brought him into like a keyboard shop and bought him like a Casio thing, but it was just one of the crappy ones that didn't like just had all presets for different sort of stuff. So it just had like, you know, Samba and a portatone style thing. And we're like, that's not, that's not it. You know, that's not like how they, how they make techno. So it took me a while to kind of figure out, okay, you need like a sequencer and a sampler and stuff like that. And, but once, once I kind of got there and um, actually the same friend's dad bought me like, future music magazine and like gave me like an Aphex twin tape and stuff like that. So, uh, nice. you know, yeah, that, that was, that was nice. And my uh, friend of my mom's gave me like a copy of, uh, maybe Cubase or something and put it on our PC. And from there, and I was kind of like, okay, now, now I understand how it works and just started collecting from there. Excellent. Yeah. Cause I remember like computer music, uh, used to come with a CD with, you'd get like demo yeah. programs and shareware programs and yeah. things like that. And yeah, occasionally they'd have like full version of Cakewalk for you yeah, know, exactly. Windows yeah. 3.1. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was really good like that. That was kind of, that was the internet for, you know, for, uh, pre-internet, I suppose, you know, um, well, I suppose the internet was probably starting around off at the time, but it was like really easy to, yeah, once you had the magazine, then it was like, okay, now I understand that. And they'd have like tutorials for like sequencing, you know, different things and um, like how to get synths to talk to each other with MIDI and, uh, you know, basic studio setups and stuff like that. So then it was like, okay, this is, and then, and then I did a course in uh, sound engineering and that kind of pieced the rest of it together. Yeah, I, I, I had none of that knowledge. I came from a more sort of classical music background where I played piano and studied sort of music theory and things like that. So, But I didn't have any of the electronic music or sound engineering knowledge. So it was in meeting Dara and he kind of taught me everything he, he knew as well. And he kind of got me into producing by myself a few years after meeting through like using Reason. And he showed me how to kind of like what an EQ was and what you know different things did. Um, so I think we both sort of like showed each other different things over the years had a back and forth in that way as well which i think has been helpful for the project and ian showed me the the key of <laughs> ian showed me the key of c minor which i overused <laughs> then for about a hundred years <laughs> afterwards <laughs> No, it's, yeah, I think it's, um, yeah, it's really great when you find people that you sort of complement your style. And I guess that was, is one of my questions really about, um, yeah, what sort of led you to, to decide, you know, you two together are going to work and go forward and make tunes together. Like, what was it about your, your combination? I think it was like, we were on a similar wavelength musically when we met, like we were into all or most of the same stuff, you know, in, in, in terms of like, lots of styles of music were both like obviously really into electronic music really into like metal music um and then we both had more and more of an ear for sort of like experimental music for want of a better term um just kind of out there sounds and stuff so we had shared a lot of similar tastes um and then we were yeah i think we were able to complement each other like you said able to show each other things and and kind of push each other a little bit out of our comfort zones into like exploring new things so i think that relationship developed early on we were in a four four piece band with two other friends initially that was the sort of setup and um, we'd record it in dara's parents place it was where we kind of had a little setup with all his gear and we go out there and record and then when that it dissolved after a couple of years we both decided we still want to make music together we liked the sort of vibe we had and the the sounds that we did make in the studio so it just kind of it just kind of organically grew from there we're good friends as well so it just the whole thing just made sense we make made tracks and had fun together um, so yeah. And how would you describe those early tracks that you made together? 
I was actually listening to them recently. Sorry, sorry, there you go. Yeah, we yeah we took a we took we kind of went through different. I, I feel like the first part of our writing stuff was kind of like research. You know, it was like us trying different styles. We would kind of do a bit of this style, and then we kind of tried a bit of that style, and it was kind of like. It was good for us. It was kind of like searching, searching, like learning different production stuff, kind of trying to figure out what what suited us. Also, the gig, you know, the gigs that we were getting as well were kind of, you know, I, I, in some ways, I, I, when I think back on it now, that actually probably influenced our style at the lot a, a lot as well. Dublin was a very mixed scene, you know, it wasn't kind of very one specific style ruled, you know, like we never really made straight up club music, like straight up techno. Um, so we always kind of ended up playing these weirdy, weird, smaller, weird gigs, you know, <laughs> where it'd be like in a pub somewhere and somebody had brought in a sound system or something or, you know, so it kind of, yeah, we just ended up kind of being very loose with all the stuff, with all the different genres that we did. And yeah, it was cool. I guess also trying out your productions on the dance floor as well was probably a nice part of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was funny for us though, because I think our initial few years of producing music, we didn't really consider production. It was all about just the ideas, trying to trying to get like the melodic idea down, or trying to like be as experimental as possible with the structure of the track. We were always just like focused on the kind of idea and the and not at all the production. And I think it took a friend of ours. We'd been together for a few years making tracks going like, what the hell's wrong with you guys? What, what's up with your sound? Like, do you never master your tracks? Do you never... B-? We were like, well, we didn't even consider that like mixing. And even though we, you know, both knew about it and Dara had, has an experience in sound engineering, we just didn't really consider that side of it for years. But I think looking back, that was kind of a, you know, that, that has has its benefits because we did just try so much stuff early on. And I was just saying there, I, I listened to some of the early stuff recently. I was going through my hard drive and I found a folder with old older tracks on it. And like they're really um like yeah, the production wise they don't sound very proficient, um but there's a huge amount of ideas and a huge amount of character and you can just you can kind of feel the the naivety in them in them but in a really like lovely way they're just full of sort of like this energy and ideas and stuff, um and I think that's uh it's kind of like the beginner thing as well isn't it you can just do really beautiful things when you're a beginner at something because you're not really concerned with the formalities of whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, so the, there was a lot of that in the early stuff Definitely. as well. Um, the kind of Dara often describes it, I think, as the magpie thing. We just pick from stuff we liked, just take everything. It was never our desire to be one particular thing, so we just never did it. It just didn't feel natural, I think. It's not that we've had anything against being one style. It just didn't feel natural for us to do that. We were just into so many things and wanted to try you know, as much as possible within the sort of... The only sort of confines, I think, were the fact that we make electronic music. So it was going to be music made with electronic sounds, sampled or, you know, synthetic. That was sort of the only limitation for us at the beginning. Everything else was just, let's give it a go. <laughs> and in some ways, in some ways as well, I also feel that the the way, because we, like I, I was DJing probably from the start as well, but never, I was never like a club DJ or anything like that. And I never had a regular gig at it. I just buy records and play at, you know, maybe a house party here and there. But like, I never had a club gig. I never had that many, I never really had any club gigs, I suppose, at the start, you know, it was, I was more focused on being a producer. I was more interested in that. And so then it wasn't until, I don't think it's until you start properly DJing in clubs that you can kind of see, okay, now I see the difference between like a well-produced track and a badly produced track, you know, and <laughs> it kind of, you know, you're like, okay, there, there is a relevance for it. There is, you know, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a, a cage or whatever, but you can kind of say, you know, like the experience of DJing in clubs and seeing what music mixes well together and also kind of, you know, it, it kind of gives you that energy. And also you kind of think, what music do I want to hear when I'm in a club? And then you're, and then you kind of, then you think about it and you go, oh, wouldn't it be amazing if I was in a club and I heard this? <laughs> and then you kind of go, oh, that's the music I should make. And they kind of, it's a nice feedback loop then as well, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I, you're, you, it's, that's exactly what um, I spoke to Infected Mushroom uh, a few weeks ago, and they've, they're a duo. They've been together for like twenty five years or so, and yeah, Dove Dead said the same thing about that feedback loop when you put a, when you put a track out and you see what the audience how the audience reacts, 
and then you come away from that gig and you go back in the studio um yeah that must be um yeah that must be a, a really um empowering way to make your music to like project it where you know it's got to go to yeah 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 i suppose you know it's about it's about taking it but not being not being confined by it as well because yeah the the opposite end of that spectrum <laughs> is when you end up just being like you know you end up kind of like discarding good ideas because you're like oh this must be produced uh you know, in this sort of way at this tempo, you know, and it has to work and it has to have four bars or, you know, has to have like 32 bars at the start to mix into another track and stuff. And so that can be, that can be, um, yeah, restrictive as well. But I suppose when you've seen people who mix, who are really good DJs who can mix wild, wildly from stuff, you know, from one genre to another and just don't really care, then you're like, okay, so there's a place for everything there as well, you know? Yeah, for sure. It just depends how it's done. I think, you know, how you move from different things and, how and where um yeah but definitely that thing like Dara was saying of of knowing what works that can really shape positively and negatively what you do in the studio like the positive side being able to uh, kind of make things and, and then envision the vi- the environment it's going to be in and then do it and it feels amazing and the, and the end result works really well but as you said the opposite then just going oh this works so let's do this rather than exploring other interesting or exciting areas but but just to, to go back to just something Dara said there um just about in the early days, Dara DJing, because he, he DJed before we um, kind of started making t- music as a duo. And before I started DJing, again, Dara taught me how to DJ. Um, but he used to DJ after we'd play these gigs as a band, as a four-piece band, and Dara would DJ afterwards as the kind of closing DJ and at house parties and stuff. And I think the style of tracks that he would have played, because they weren't, as you said, straight up club tracks, they really influenced our early sound in a way that I don't think I've ever acknowledged before. Just when you said it there, Dara, I was like, oh shit, that really did, was a big influence on the kind of sound we made. This, this, the, the records you were buying and playing and, and kind of pushing in your sets were, were, were definitely influential. Yeah, uh, what sort of records were they? What sort of stuff were you playing? I suppose at the very start when I was into, when I was doing my sound engineering course, I was listening to um, probably just a mixture of Warpy type stuff, like IDM stuff, and also like, Birmingham techno. I was obsessed with Birmingham techno with uh, like, uh, yeah, just that, well, UK techno, I suppose. I don't know what you call it, but yeah, just that very kind of stark, robotic, you know, and that was another nice loop that happened to us then. You know, I, I would have bought James Ruskin's records and then years later we got signed to his label and got to meet him and stuff like that and i totally had a fan moment <laughs> where it's just like i didn't need to, i didn't need lunch one day to save money to buy your record you know uh, and you know when i was in college uh yeah I, I, like i only had so much money and i just like didn't eat my lunch and went in and bought like you know uh just this weird uk techno or whatever and bring it home and it was so it was so out there for me you know, to hear that type of music. It was like the first type of music that had absolutely no melody in it. <laughs> it was just like, it was just like, I, I still remember some of the records, like just so sparse, so mechanical, like so industrial, no, no, emo, no, not emotion, but you know what I mean? No traditional sig- uh, signifiers of like, you know, here's the chorus and here's the verse. Like you put the record, you put the needle down in three parts of the record and it's just absolutely hammering <laughs> fairly similar all the way through. And you're just like, that's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. That sort of sounds. Um, so yeah, it was kind of, there was, there was one, it was like a way of traveling to like strange places. <laughs> I just want to, just want to say there was one particular track Dara used to play in his DJ sets that was really inspiring and influential for me i just had to look it up here in discogs i couldn't remember the name but it's a band called or a duo called finney tribe and the track was called flying mm-hmm. peppers the ep is called flying peppers anyway there's three three tracks on it and i think it was the a side flying peppers that dara used to play and it's like a 10 minute epic of a track i don't know if you know it uh, chris but if you don't i would definitely recommend checking it out um, I do. I've got some Finney Tribe records. I've got. I think I have a white label that's just got Finney Tribe stamped yeah. on it. But I, I would not know a track name. Um, okay. Yeah, but yeah. I'll definitely check but, it out. What was it about that track? What was it about? It's, it? it's, it's a it's a long track, and it just goes through so many different sort of like almost like movements and sections, and it's got elements of like old UK hardcore. It's got elements of old sort of like bits that sound like the old Prodigy. Then it's got elements that are almost like orchestral. It's got this really experimental edge as well. It's beautifully melodic and really uplifting and epic. It just has so much in it over the course of this 10 minutes, a real journey. And I think that really influenced us as well, because 
I think we like that. As Dara mentioned, like Laurie Anderson and narrative earlier, I think we always like that music that goes on a journey, a music that changes um, within the track, goes through changes and moments and sort of like, even though like we were into, like Dara particularly was into that Birmingham sound. He was just describing where it's the same all the way through. I think early, and it's still always been there for us. We've liked music that also has, has changes. Um, like old UK hardcore rave did that sometimes. It just be drops and changes constantly throughout the tracks. Um, so I think that's something we that really influenced influenced us and that track particularly Flying Peppers by Finney Tribe was a big one. I think I think early on in our music we went through too many changes. We tried to change the track far too much and it lost any sort of coherence. So I think over the years we tried to refine it, get that sense of just sense of dynamics. I think you know movement dynamics and not any sort of like traditional narrative, but just a, a sense of a journey or a movement without losing the coherence of a track. That's kind of something we've always uh, tried to f- to find that line in our music. Yeah, it's important, I think, when you're young to overdo stuff, you know. Yeah, definitely. And, yeah. You know, yeah, we 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 went we went like way down the kind of thing of like we we're nearly like the pro- a prog rock in terms of electronics. <laughs> you know, we were like doing changes and all this sort of stuff, and we kind of thought that the more changes we did, and, yeah, the you know, more complex the better. Keys and all this sort of stuff, and yeah, the more complex the better, of course. <laughs> yeah, you know? of course. And then and, and then, yeah, it's a, it makes sense. It's maths, you know. But um, <laughs> but yeah, then after a while. And I think I think one Ian Ian bought the record, and I think one one of the things that really pulled us back at one stage was when he got the burial record and he put it on, and I was just like, oh yeah, that's that's kind of amazing. It's just like some of the tracks are just one amazing loop, really, and I can you can just listen to it for hours. I mean, you could just listen to like an eight bar loop of burial for a day, <laughs> and you might even get sick of it. You know, it's just such a great, it's just such a great. Uh, yeah, so so refined and stuff. And uh, yeah, there are changes within the tracks and they kind of move around and stuff. But yeah, you know, we, we did, I suppose, probably go a little bit overboard uh, at some stage as well with the kind of composition. Yeah, I think you're, you're entitled to do that, you know, in, in for the um, for the experimentation of it, you know, like go down whatever road you feel you want to go down. Um, Definitely. Yeah, you're entitled to do that yeah. for sure. I, I, Make it I think, way uh, too complicated. Yeah, I think ne- it's necessary, as Dara said, I think, to just explore those avenues. Yeah. May I close yeah. mistakes. In the words of our in the words of our friend Trevor, if if you're gonna do it, overdo it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good philosophy. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting what you say about the journey, because it only, only because I spoke to Annie Klang uh, on the interview last time, who who is a techno DJ, and she said about she always tries to put suspense and release in her tracks, anticipation and arrival in her tracks, and anxiety and relief. And I thought that was a really nice way to sort of sum up that journey. I really like the way that she she said that she's got those two polar things happening. Um, And when, um, Ian, when you were talking about that track, I think I do know that track, or I'm getting a particular track in my head um, with a very specific, uh, with a, I can see the label for it. Um, It's sort of white and purple and with maybe some blue and like an eye that's, um, split in two, mirrored. I could be totally wrong, but I think, yeah, it sort of rings a bell when you were describing that track. Yeah, I, I can send you a link to the track that I, that I mean it afterwards. I'll find it on YouTube and send it to you. You might, you, you might know it. Oh, it's geez. definitely worth that. I might worth do, either yeah. listening to for the first time or diving back in if you already know it. It's, it's a great track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to say, I am from very close to Birmingham. I'm from a small town that's about an hour from Birmingham. So we used to go to like House of God and the Q Club and I saw Surgeon play live a lot and you write about the very little melody in the tracks you know it's the sort of thing if your parents come in and listen to it they're like why are you listening to that it's just (laughs) noise you know yeah (laughs) Yeah. but yeah Birmingham Techno was amazing and James Ruskin as well is another name of um that I haven't really yeah I've got some of his records in my collection and um I didn't know anyone else that used to play his record like back in the day. So it's great that you were also on that same, on that same vibe, uh, Dara. Yeah. yeah, he seems to have gotten more and more interesting recently as well. That the stuff that Ruskin has been putting out over the last few years is a real element of of like every melodic element, an element of kind of electronica or or that sort of sound um, mixed in with the techno and really lush and beautiful. And the stuff he does as the fear ratio, Mark Broom. On scam with Mark, yeah, Brown, that yeah. stuff is amazing as well. It's really awesome stuff. 
Um, he's still, yeah, still making great electronic music, James. Really fun. And uh, yeah, I think the same about burial. You know, like an an eight bar loop of burial is just like a wonderful place to be in. You know, <laughs> yeah, sit and sit and stay there for a while. Yeah, I, I, a friend of mine makes a thing called a MIDI switcher, um, which is like you can send MIDI to it, and it all it's got eight switches in a row, and it'll either turn on like a light, an LED light, or make a motor fire off, so you can. You can sort of program it to do stuff using MIDI. And um, I, I tried to make the uh, Aphex Twin bouncing ball uh, like a light show for that track. And I only used, I used a very short amount of that track. I mean, probably 20 seconds or something. And it took me about three hours to program anything <laughs> that looked nearly good. But yeah, the amazing imagine. thing was, I kept hearing, yeah, I kept hearing new parts of this this tiny loop of music. I had listened to it for hours, and I was like, it was, it just became more engrossing the more I listened to it. Phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, that's an amazing. Yeah, I thing. suppose that's that deep, deep, deep listening Pauline Oliveira's thing. Just kind of, yeah, just like really, really deconstructing stuff. But I think that's also a, you know, it's important when you're. You know, I think it's good to be into a lot of different types of stuff uh, in the in your early phase of your music career, uh, m- mainly just to focus on different production styles because there's so many. You know, by by really deeply listening to lots of different types of music, you get so many different uh, production ideas. You know, like uh, you know, like even even metal. You know, even though we used to like um, Weezer, kind of like a poppy, poppy punk band, I suppose you could call them. But like, I remember when I heard Weezer's recordings first, I was like, wow, the production on that is amazing. You know, like there's, you know, the the kind of way they mic the kits and stuff like that. It had like a really interesting sound. Um, like there's, there's with every genre of music, there's like, you know, an infinity of production techniques that you can learn from them. So the more you go through, the more kind of weapons you have in your arsenal, you know, to, you know, and then, and then once you kind of find your own groove, you've a lot more, a lot more kind of tools to use, I think. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I did, I, I did um, hear you speak about that in a previous interview about, yeah, learning those genre of production techniques and applying them elsewhere. Yeah. What sort of things have you drawn from, from um, particular genres? I suppose genres? it changes all the time for us. You know, we go through, you know, we go through, as Lacquer recently, yeah, we've probably written, you know, like each album we've probably done has have had a bit of a kind of an idea and a vibe behind it. So it depends what we're listening to at the time. But I think um, an, an interesting thing is, sorry, just a, an interesting thing for me is, is like, it seems like each style has a sort of, um, you know, codified or sort of formalized way of, of, of producing that particular music. Like techno, for example, you know, you want the, the kicks to be at a certain uh, frequency to hit in certain places, certain dB levels, at certain frequencies, and you want things to be clear and sound good for certain sound systems. But I always find it interesting to try and like take the production style from something else and apply it to something else. Like you know, taking sort of like the I don't know, even like you, you hear it, I suppose like you, know, you get like lo-fi approaches to that you might find in sort of punky shoegaze music and apply it to house music or techno. And I always find those sort of things interesting where it's sort of like a mismatch mm. of of style and production technique. Um, I think they can often lead to interesting new sort of avenues. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, you know, the, the, the most obvious tech, uh, example of that is the way people use kind of dub techno. They've taken, you know, mm. the dub techniques and applied it to techno. But yeah, there's so there's so many more you can do, you know, and or you can take you can do it as a, co- a composition style sort of thing, you know, where you take a certain type of composition or, you know, musical kind of ideas and apply them to a different genre. And so yeah, there's there's so, you know, it's a kind of a lifelong learning process. You'll never, you'll never get through it. And I think that's, that's, you know, that's what I love about electronic music. It's like the way to, it's just, you know, it's the most open palette in some ways, you know, you can kind of, you can take any style, you can try anything, you can try and, 
chainsaw two things <laughs> together if it works it does if it doesn't it doesn't it's grand you know you can just you can you can try it so anyway. one thing i haven't heard pe people try is to take like uh the sort of no production at all aesthetic of black metal and apply that to sort of club music forms i've yet to really hear that <laughs> it would be interesting might sound like shit though in a club <laughs> tear the ears off <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it would maybe be interesting as an experiment to try and yeah break the fourth walls of what yeah those product you know anything that you do learn in production and just do the opposite to it or yeah i don't know like multiply it you know like um yeah mess around with it definitely where do you where do you find inspiration sonically like um i know you've used uh, a lot of like found sound sort of foley recordings and stuff um yeah where do you take what, what sort of sources do you use to make music it's pretty varied, isn't it? Like kind of anything and everything. I think like Dara was mentioning there, we go through phases, um, both kind of together and individually as well. I think like for the last few years, I've been really in a phase of just wanting to sample, like not really use any sort of synth synthesis at all and just sample and process samples, either th things I recorded myself or other music. I still get really inspired by the sounds used in other music, like hearing other producers and just going, "Ooh, how do they do that?" Or, you know, what do they, what is that sound? And um, hearing people use unusual sounds for, like, uh, like drums, for example, hearing unusual sounds used for particular drum hits, you're like, "Ooh, that's a cool idea." So that sort of thing. But I think yeah, we go through phases. I think we're we're moving back into like a phase of synthesis now. I think Dara has been particularly on a on a synthesis vibe recently and trying out new sort of uh, tools, new synths we haven't used before. So a lot of the recent music is a lot more synth heavy and that kind of feels good because it's like, oh, I haven't done this in a while. So that feels sort of fresh to work on it again. Um, so yeah, we're just, it's kind of any anything yeah. and everything for us. I don't, I don't think we're precious about where sounds come from or the sources, you know, that we get our sounds from. Things don't have to sound a particular way for us to use them. They just have to work for that track or that mood that we're in. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think generally, especially for me, yeah, I, I do I do tend to get obsessed about uh, certain things. So yeah, yeah, it was synthesis there for a while, and I, I would often try and make myself these kind of challenges of trying to make like a whole track on one MIDI channel or something. And so you know that that's one thing I love to do is like it was an exercise I got when I was in in college, and I I, I still try and do it. Like so, just write the whole melody and drums and everything on one MIDI channel. So. Uh, I'm trying to kind of generate, uh, like I do some sound design work for Ableton Native Instruments stuff as as well. Um, but I do, I do love, I do love kind of trying to make like a whole world within a, a synth patch, you know, and just like, because um, I also, I do think, you know, there is cert there's a certain clarity that you get with synthesized drums and zaps and blips and stuff like that, that you can't get from samples. But then there are certain, there's certain texture, obviously with samples and, you know, it, it, pitching affects it differently or you know when you when you pitch up like a 909 a sampled 909 or 808 sorry uh, 808 snare you know there's a certain snap that you get to it that you just cannot synthesize <laughs> um so there's certain you know there's certain things that um that only work with with either sampling or synthesis but yeah i do i do i do love a good synthesis rabbit hole uh, <laughs> now and then and, uh, i love that too cuz then i i get to work on what you as done. I can. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think a good thing about our, uh, you know, our, our collaboration is that Dara, Dara is really good at starting things and really enjoys starting and trying out new tools and trying out new things and generating loads of ideas. And I really like working on stuff that is already there. I like really like developing things. So for me, it's like, it's like, uh, you know, I get all these new toys to play from Dara, all these starter tracks that I get to kind of explore and, and deconstruct and, and play with. So I think that's a really sort of a healthy and uh, part of our collabor collaboration that we have that that sort of like we both do, kind of do everything but we do have these sort of like roles that we that we generally fit into um as we work and that's one i, I really enjoy is getting all these synth patches that <laughs> i just don't make the time i think i suppose to fully explore myself but dara does and i get them and go cool i can i can play with these now <laughs> nice nice yeah the um i, th I think the there are like the limitations you were talking about. They're such a such a valuable way to create. Um, uh, yeah, doing things like that, just sticking everything on one MIDI channel. I've spoken to like chip tune artists uh, recently uh, in Null Sleep. I spoke to Null Sleep, who makes music on Game Boy, and obviously there's huge limitations in what he's doing there. But um, yeah, it just it yeah just that was one out... of that was the one of 
the things that inspired me years ago was that my my college lecturer told me about the Belgian demo scene. I've probably talked about this before, but the whole idea was that you had to fit everything on a floppy disk. You know, um, and I, I I nearly did it with our AV set there for a <laughs> while. I had like a full AV set that uh, that I could email to myself. You know, so I was delighted with that for a while. Uh, but yeah, you know, just yeah, constraints and you know, I think Ian did a bit of it in in when he was in college doing his masters. Just the idea of kind of you know. Um, yeah, using constraints and uh, what's the name of that type of composition where it's um, it's gone out of my head now, but where you have rules and stuff and, uh, you know, you kind of just try and create within these set of rules and structures. Um, You're thinking like... Uh, John can, Cage can it, did some of it with the chance and... There's like um, serialism kind of stuff. I mean, like those sort of to tone rows and... Yeah, rows yeah, and I suppose, it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like just just the idea of like seeing how far you can push a push one idea, you know. Yeah. Um, and that was yeah. I suppose kind of the one of the AV sets, the very first AV set we did. I liked that idea as well. I just had the whole AV set was made out of three PNGs, just three simple circle shapes, and I was like, okay, how much can I do with this? You know, uh, how you know just by moving three colorful circles around. You know where's the end of it and it took it took me years <laughs> to yeah. to you know like I, I kept it going for years where i was like this is still really interesting you know and then eventually i was like okay maybe it's time for a square you know but <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no no I, I changed then but yeah it's just uh you know i think I, th I think yeah it's really important to do that to, definitely because nowadays you have so many possibilities and everything is open and you can do everything but yeah, so try, try if you're if you're not feeling inspired, try some try some rules, try some restraint, and just see where you can push it. You know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I I totally love that idea of the floppy disk, man. When I read that, I was like, <laughs> that's so fucking cool. Um, it's a little bit. I you know we we all know like Brian Eno does the oblique strategies where it's like creative mm. things yeah, to that's do the stuff. and. Um, he um, there's also one that he would say he'd go into a studio and just enforce rules on the session. Like we can't multiply mm. anything today. And then that has so many different meanings and like you can add, apply it yeah. to a lot of stuff. Yeah. I thought about making it like a little max for life thing that would do that. So it's like a rolling of the dice and it just gives you limitations on what you can do in Ableton. Um, yeah, yeah. I thought about just throwing together like, or even like open, just like putting out a shout out on forums to say, what would you say was a good limitation? And then um, just crowdsource all of the content and have a little Max for Live device that says, don't amplify anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. I heard another, I heard another good one from, from I, don't know, I think I've heard uh, more modern producers doing this where, well, I heard one somebody talking about LimeWire when LimeWire used to exist, they'd go to, They'd type a certain thing into LimeWire. They'd go to wherever it was, and they'd just pick the first thing they saw. Or some people do it with YouTube, where they type in like a certain word into YouTube, and then they go to the tenth page, and they pick the fourth <laughs> video down, and they they have to do something with that. Do you know what I mean? And even if it's a load of dog shit, they're like, they kind of have to try and make something of it. So, you know, I think there's all these techniques because it's hard to be inspired all the time as an artist. You know, like uh, I'm going to sit down and write the greatest music that has ever existed. You know, sometimes yeah. you're just like, eh, you know, I just want to sit down and scratch around and try some stuff. Um, and yeah, they're kind of just good ways of like getting the, getting a vibe going or, or trying something. Yeah. Cause I think it will, it will nearly always push you into like uh, ways of thinking that you don't normally think it, it was it, it, it kind of this conversation with limitations just makes me think of what we were talking uh, about a minute ago in terms of like listening to something on repeat. Um, and it's sort of like, pushes you into a, a different way of thinking and different way of experiencing the music. Um, I think there's sort of like parallels there between, um, it, it, to me, it's, all, it's almost like both, both things are ways of magnifying things that you don't see initially. Like repetition is one of those things. You'll hear things you don't hear initially. For me, like in the studio, tools like EQ and Compressor do that too. It's like you magnify these things and you hear these sounds that you didn't know were initially there. And I think also limitations work in the same way. They push you into way, ways of noticing things ways of working or ideas that you just don't think about initially or you're not don't realize they're initially there until you set the limitations and you're like oh i could do this or this small the smallest thing imaginable in this piece is actually really interesting i can extrapolate that and stuff so i think it's like yeah honing in on what's already there is stuff and really a really helpful uh tool i suppose or uh technique like and also 
Yeah, also like that idea comes, you know, I think we sometimes see it in text. If you're reading something or if you're trying to spell something or looking at a word, like the word only, that that if you keep looking at it and keep looking at it, you're like, oh, on, only. <laughs> and then you see it that way. And then and then after a while, you're like, that's such a weird way to write something. And then <laughs> and then and then you just kind of go and then you're after a while, you're like, is that even how you spell that word? Uh, uh, and and so it's just, yeah, kind of. Like just really, really looking at something and just constantly looking at it and trying to see it in different ways. Yeah, it's just a, it's a, a good way of creatively getting the juices going, I suppose. Absolutely. You just made me laugh then because I'm, I'm, I was thinking about when I was a kid, I, used to, I did that with the word lounge. <clears throat> said the word lounge like over and over and over and even now I, like, I start to feel sick thinking <laughs> about it because it's yeah. so confusing. <laughs> Yeah, as as I've learned, like I'm learning, obviously learning German here, and uh, you know, then after you talk to other people whose English isn't their first language, they're like, English is such a weird language. It's spelled so, you know, there's so many different types of spellings for different words and stuff like that, and yeah, so I wonder if there's some part of language that uh, has, yeah, has an effect on how we think about things. Definitely. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I absolutely think so. Yeah. Um, and just the sound of some words in other languages just grab you, don't they? Even if it's an insignificant yeah. word. Um, yeah. Uh, formiga is Portuguese for ant. Oh, I really like it's that word. It's just an ant. It's just the word <laughs> ant. Formiga. Yeah. But is I just yeah, I remember hearing that in Portuguese and going, wow, it's a beautiful word. And then you say it to someone in Portuguese and they're like, no, it's just an ant. ant. <laughs> Same yeah, with yeah. me for the, the Portuguese word for pineapple is abacashi. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's like yeah, abacashi, yeah. abacashi. And I was like, I fucking love that word and it's just a pineapple. <laughs> but I also love the, <laughs> love the word formica because there was an Irish electronic artist years ago called Formica and I was thought that's a cool name. And then I, I when I heard it was Portuguese for ant, I was like, oh, <laughs> It's funny, isn't it? But it's it? yeah, also, it isn't it for, for mica? It's also a type of stone, isn't it? Wow. Do you have any? Are there any words for you, Dara, that in other languages that you just that just? Get um, my my head is pretty mashed up with languages at the minute <laughs> because, um, yeah, my 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 daughter speaks Spanish to, um, in, in the house, and then we're learning German, and uh, then we we also speak English as well. So my, you know, it's just a hot mess really in there at the minute. I, I hmm. often. I'm just so confused. I've forgotten English words. And it's just, yeah, I, I, to be honest, I don't even really want to get into it. <laughs> That's cool, man. Yeah. It's like putting your, putting the train on a different track, speaking different languages, yeah. isn't it? You like yeah. the switch. I'm, I'm too old for this shit. How do, how do you find living in Berlin? Like, what 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 brought you there? And um... yeah, I suppose Ian Ian actually moved here first. So um, yeah, he, he moved over, and um, then a, a, a bit later, I moved over. And yeah, my my daughter goes to school here and stuff. But yeah, I I really like it. For me, it's like I like the kind of you know because everyone is literally a DJ here. So in some ways, that kind of I feel like it's kind of gotten rid of the, some of the hierarchy, you know, that, that ex might exist in a smaller place. So, you know, it's not like, oh, sorry, you can't talk to me. I'm a very famous DJ because <laughs> it's like, okay, well, whatever, you know. So, you know, I do, I do like, I do like, I have a nice community of friends here who, who I can just kind of go and chat with and everyone's very open. And I mean, maybe I, I see it like that. Maybe others don't, but um, yeah, I, I just enjoy that part of it, and it's yeah, obviously culturally it's very open. I mean, you can do what you want, and nobody really cares. And but yeah, there are there are positives and negatives to every society, and you know, and and everywhere you live, and it's really just about the people you know. So a hundred percent, yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah. Ian, do you live do you live in Berlin? What what took you to Berlin originally? Not, originally, it was electronic music. I wanted to like get you know, deeper into electronic music. And it was just at the point where I was starting to do electronic music full time, was getting enough bookings and gigs, both with Lacquer and my solo EOMAC project that I was able to make a living from it. So it was full time. And I was like, right, I want to just take this further and just do it fully. So Berlin just made sense. That was, you know, the place where so many, you know, other musicians were living and so many clubs and it was just, a yeah, it just made sense to be there. So that's what, what brought me to Berlin initially. 
Um, and then I lived there like for about two years. And then since then, I've kind of just been back and forth. It kind of, it wasn't a place I wanted to stay full time. I kind of missed, missed some of the, the, I missed the sea and the hills <laughs> and other, other things like that. Some of the, some of the, the nature, but uh, I still pretty much since I left up until last year when the, the fucking pandemic started, I was probably in Berlin, you know, probably one, once a month, either working with Dara, seeing friends, playing shows. So I still go back and forth quite a lot. So I still have a very uh, sort of close relationship with the city. I just don't, I'm just not based there anymore. It must be, um, <clears throat> yeah, it must be a great place to live, particularly for electronic music. Um, yeah, just so yeah. many scenes happening. So many I people. Imagine. Yeah. And there's, yeah, there's just so many things, yeah, like I said, so many things going on. So many like kind of electronic music companies are based there. Uh, tech companies, software companies, yeah. as well as all the new musicians, and there's so many clubs and just initiatives happening all the time. Um, so yeah, it's it's really, uh, really helpful, I suppose, to be there as a, as an up and coming electronic musician. I found that initially it was great to like, yeah, meet people, get more involved in the scene. I think within a month of being there, I did my like, first boiler room show, which was a huge thing for me at the time. It was like, just wow. just shit, shit just started happening in ways that it it didn't or wasn't <laughs> happening in in a smaller city like Dublin. Um, which has its own benefits. A smaller city has other sort of benefits, but those sort of um, very practical things of of uh, being a full time musician made sense in, in Berlin. Um, nice. Plus, it's a it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun <laughs> to be there to be around so many people doing the same thing and having same you know experiences and on similar wavelengths and yeah, especially in the summertime. Berlin is is great in the summertime. Nice, nice. Yeah, and I can understand that. Yeah, if there are a lot of electronic artists or just artists in general around you. Yeah, you're not really going to be bothered by people idolizing you so much. You can sort of get on on yeah, a similar but, wavelength. I find most people to be really approachable and just open and, you know, fairly welcoming as well. Yeah, I suppose that's, you know, when, you know, we were we both grew up in Dublin and so there wasn't a huge there wasn't a huge amount of very well-known electronic music people there. So you know, uh, we, I was totally starstruck with the first time I met some people over here. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh my God, it's it's Carson Nikolai or it's, you know, so-and-so. And everyone else is just like, ah, oh, yeah, whatever, you know. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I suppose that's nice as well. It has its own. It's yeah, I guess um, I guess when you tell people that like Aphex Twin and Surgeon have played your records, they go, yeah, yeah, of course he has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 join the club. <laughs> How does that feel when when that when you sort of hear a bit of people playing your records? Like, what 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 does that feel like? Yeah, it feels amazing to be honest. Yeah, it feels feels great to get that sort of um, feedback and sort of uh, um, what's what's the word? I suppose in in the early days, maybe less so now, but in the early days, sort of like validation, like, oh, cool, what we're doing actually is is good, and it's 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 meaningful that enough that some of our heroes want to play it. It's like, wow, that's that that felt amazing. Um, those two you mentioned, I remember like Apex Twin playing our, our stuff was it was a huge deal for both of us. Like we're massive Apex Twin fans, and and for him to sort of give it like that stamp of approval, you go, okay, wow, this is we're on the right track. Like we're not fooling ourselves into thinking that this could be something, you know, <laughs> those sort of feelings. And also Absolutely. Surgeon, Surgeon as well was one of the like people early on that was playing the the twelve inch we had on Killy Kills uh, Spider Silk. Um, so it was also amazing to hear him play that. We're like, okay, cool, this is. You know, it was kind of a techno record. We were we were sort of like fitting, finding ourselves in the techno scene at that at that time. So it was great to get like that surge and play it at that time in our in our sort of uh, career, <laughs> for want of a better word. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, but, <laughs> journey, <laughs> but Absolutely. journey maybe better better word there. Um, you know, yeah. it's also important to tell other artists that you appreciate their work as well. You know, like you know, I think I think. You know, people sometimes think that, you know, artists are getting like floods, maybe huge artists do, getting like floods of like messages all the time, you know. But uh, anytime anybody sends me something, I'm always so appreciative of, or, you know, I even notice that if I say it to another artist I like, I'm like, yeah, send them a message or uh, a, an email or a raven or whatever it is and just say, listen, I, you know, I really, I really like your music. It's, it's really, you know, meant a lot to me. Uh, people are always like, oh, thanks very much. You know, it's, it's always yeah. it's always nice to Definitely. to know that people are listening because it can seem a bit face faceless sometimes yeah, that's you know, true. especially if you're just putting stuff out and you have a social media account and you know all this sort of stuff but when people genuinely make an effort to write you something personal or you know if they meet you in the street and they say oh you know and yeah i think it's it's like i i try and 
do it more now as well. If I see people, I just in the street or whatever, or if I see, you know, if I find somebody online or whatever, I'll just send them a message and say, listen, I really like your stuff. Thank you very much. And yeah, people, people always, you know, you never know what an artist is going through as well. You know, it's tough times for artists now. It's a weird, you know, it's a tough time with the pandemic, but it's also a tough time in terms of, you know, like if you're not gigging, you're not making money um and now nobody's gigging and yeah it's just kind of it's nice to let people it's not nice nice to let people know that their music and then it kind of builds builds a nice connection with, with artists as well you know most artists who don't have their head up their arse are still you know they're still very appreciative and enjoy the kind of the contact absolutely like g- genuine connection is always meaningful and it's always going to feel good i think and particularly like in this as you're saying not just this pandemic year but this sort of digital age we live in it can be harder and harder to find actual actual connection like there's sort of like you know uh, superficial connection is easy but the actual connection that genuine sort of um, connection between people is is can be difficult to find sometimes so to yeah to share that and express that is always always worthwhile and always meaningful you're probably better at that than I am. Yeah, rather than just a few fire fire emojis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fire, fire emojis. emojis yeah. They they can feel good too. Yeah. Eyes with stars too. in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A good fire emoji can can, can work wonders, you know, but you know. Unfortunately. Yeah, it's, it's, nice to, it's nice to make an extra effort, I suppose. I've got to just show yeah. you, um, whenever, if someone sends me emojis, this is my phone. So if someone sends me emojis, <laughs> I just get four blank squares or five blank squares and I'm like... Don't know if it's good or bad. I don't know if they. Is, yeah. what, what the fuck is it? <laughs> so, but yeah, you're right. I think. Yeah. I think that's. I think you're better off. That's it. I know. I love that stuff. I. I. Lo- I couldn't ever have a smartphone. I hate it. Like it just doesn't work for me at all. Um, um, and I think you're right about. I think you're right about um, recognizing. Pe- you know, recognizing artists that you really like and telling them that. You know, because yeah, um, yeah I think artists are all sort of creative people who are you know as vulnerable as anyone else um sometimes putting their heart and their emotions out for people to listen to and definitely people are going to criticize anyone you know i'm sure Aphex twin and surgeon have had people telling them their shit you know for years so yeah you're right to just um emily dolan davis is a drummer that i interviewed she drummed with the darkness and uh, she said that yeah throughout her whole career she made a point of if she saw someone that was talented she would go up to them and tell them that she thought that she was like that is one of my rules of 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 her yeah. industry career or her journey uh is is to recognize and acknowledge people when they when they are good yeah that's a really really positive attitude yeah oh she's super positive man she's such yeah. an amazing person <laughs> people can be very quick to uh like put forward negative uh comments and, and criticism and be much more reluctant to give over positive for some reason so i think yeah to make the effort mm. to give positive feedback is is really really important um yeah sorry you want go on there I just yeah I, I think I, I think in terms of the pandemic you know I was, I was trying to I was talking to, with some friends recently about what trying to find the good that's come out of it you know and you know you know I think it maybe it will maybe it will when everything comes back or goes back to semi-normality maybe the hybrid types of gigs will be you know like the the infrastructure that we've built to help us through the pandemic will help for you know for normal times anyway so you know like i know soundcloud um not soundcloud bandcamp have started selling uh or you can you can sell tickets to a kind of streaming performance now directly through bandcamp oh, cool and yeah i know soundcloud have improved some of their artists uh, fees and you know just just different things that have kind of kind of happened but also the the a new thing i'm I'm finding out about. Uh, I've been listening to Holly Herndon's um, podcast uh, about, and they've been talking a lot about uh, decentralized. Uh, I'm going to use all the wrong words here. This is uh, you know just the idiot idiot's guide to stuff I've heard about last week. <laughs> That's but, what um, my podcast is all about. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Uh, well, I, I'll apologize for making a, a hames of it, but um, yeah, they were just talking about like you know. Yeah, kind of more decentralized approach to owning your own data, um, artists selling their works, you know, using like nifties and kind of the Bitcoin ideal of being able to sell like uh, exclusive works, you know, digital works like one of one and stuff like that. And how maybe, you know, who knows, it could it could could shift the the kind of the 
model back to artists being able to survive without gigging, you know, because I think that's something really important that needs to happen. I think, you know, I think owning owning your content, uh, having having control over how it's used uh, and er- earning money when it's used for commercial purposes or, I mean, obviously the, the whole, you know, Spotify are, is just a whole clusterfuck that, you know, you could do a whole episode about that, but, um, uh, you know, it's like, it's hard. It, it can be hard for artists to make, to make, uh, money sometimes, you know, and, absolutely. you know, yeah. I think, I think, yeah, maybe, maybe with this kind of more a decentralized approach, who knows, it could, it could be the future of how artists can, can make money. Also just, you know, I think before the pandemic there, I'd noticed there were a lot of articles from like, was it Scream and was it Benga that stopped touring and lots of people who had just stopped touring just through mental health issues, you know, cause it's like, it's a punishing, a punishing, punishing way to earn money. Um, and if you're, if you want to sit back and just kind of do a, a sensitive album of cricket squeaks, that isn't going to, that isn't going to tour or, or, you know, isn't going to, you know, get you the bookings. It kind of puts pressure on you. So who who knows? Maybe the pandemic will have created some some good in terms of yeah the technology we use to to create and and own our own content. Who knows? Image and Heap is is working on a thing called Mycelium, which is like a blockchain blockchain yeah. payment for artists. So um, yeah, essentially, yeah, you get. Um, I don't really know how it works. So again, it's just layman's silly idea combination of mm. the stupid things that I'm interpreted. But yeah, um, essentially, the the people who are involved in the project get recognised as part of this this group and will get a fair percentage of it without sort of distributors or other people getting involved like Spotify that can take from that pot. My friend, um, a friend of mine called James Wiltshire, who uh, is or was in a group called the Freemasons. He did a YouTube video on how much you actually get if you sell a hundred thousand copies of a record. And it was like 16 grand. It was like shockingly low. And that, and I think he made the video maybe 10 years ago now. Um, Yeah. I mean, that's the, you know, the old, record industry makes you know was actually much fairer than the than the new one in some ways like people are making you know like now uh, if you did that on streams you'd probably make 16 euro so <laughs> probably less. you know what i mean it's like <laughs> yeah yeah exactly you'd probably you'd probably have to pay more to take out your money than, <laughs> than than you would earn but yeah i think you know who knows maybe maybe this new kind of system yeah, maybe the kind of crypto technology will, if they can find a, a environmentally uh, sustainable way of doing it, maybe a kind of, you know, I think we're in the exciting uh, euphoric stage, which kind of early, uh, echoes the early internet, you know, when people kind of felt the early internet would uh, kind of create these systems uh, before it got very corp- corporatized. So maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's what's happening now. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it happens in a few years. But I think a, a, a crucial thing for me, like sticking point on the on all, all all that stuff, is it's trying to change the culture of people who don't feel they should pay for music. Because so all the all the systems are are probably useless un, unless people are actually willing to to pay for music again. I think that's like the kind of cultural yeah. problem. That's just there's a whole generation of people that have never paid for music and don't feel they have to. And and you know I can understand why because they've just grown up with everything available and and that's the kind of thing it's like I don't know how, how how to shift that but I do think re- recently it feels like people do want to actually pay for music in these recent sort of band camp Fridays where they've waived fees and people have bought loads of music there's a feeling that people do want to if they just are aware of of the avenues and ways of of, of doing it that are kind of accessible I think like something like band camp is something that only music fans know it's not like a general sort of mainstream thing yet but I think pushing that out into sort of uh, or that sort of idea of, of just trying to get people to pay for pay for music again would be a, a positive step um, because yeah that, that's that or, or yeah exactly if if you think about 
if you think about like what what as as a as a music uh, consumer yourself think about what gives you value from music you know like you know it, it's nice to li- it's nice to listen to music sometimes it's nice to have sometimes you want to have a physical thing sometimes you don't sometimes you want to have interaction with the artist you know sometimes that would be a very valuable thing i mean if you you know I suppose, yeah, we're just kind of, it really is the early days, but like, if you think how much you'd pay to talk to your favorite artists and ask them some questions about certain things. So maybe there's a streaming thing where um, you could, you know, like I chop off my own right leg to talk to Odd Tecker about some technical stuff. You know what I mean? I'd just be like, just, you know, I'd be like... I think, yeah, they, I'll I think just, they'd be happy to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, that's that sort of thing. I'd so, be less likely obviously, to talk to someone if they chopped off know, their own leg to speak to me. I'd be just like, no. <laughs> just to do it. <laughs> I'm going to do we'll it now. Get, just, we'll just to, to prove I'm, I'm willing to do it. Stay away. Walk up to Laurie Anderson and go, I chopped my leg off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, will be, this will become viral and then they'll have to <laughs> respond somewhere. They'll have to, have to come and visit me in hospital. <laughs> my plan, my cunning plan is worked. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so who, who knows? Hopefully... Hopefully, you know, I think maybe the pandemic has shown people that, yeah, our artists, you know, like being a full-time artist, it, it, it is, it's a full-time job, you know, it, it takes, it takes so much work, you know, there's like, you know, there's not, o- not only writing music, there's like all the other promotional stuff that goes with it, then there's like, you know, kind of research, then there's just having time when you're not being an artist uh, to kind of be able to switch off and have some time away from it and able to be able to kind of come back and know that you'll have some sort of steady steady stream of of income because you know if you think about all the great albums that were written you know before the pre-internet times they were written you know a lot of them were written after artists had kind of gone through a process of like writing one or two albums and really kind of found their groove and you know like so yeah obviously there's some amazing debut albums as well but there is there is value in like long term musicians you know who after years really hone their craft and could afford to do it because i mean i don't think very few artists so some artists just want to be rich but most artists would be happy with the living wage Definitely, i think yeah. is the end at the end of the day most artists you know who love their craft would be happy just to be able to pay their rent and eat and like yeah obviously if somebody used there for a big film you want to be paid fairly but most people you know most people just want a living wage and yeah mm. i think that uh, just on something you said there that the thing i personally find challenging in, in all this is finding the time to do all the things like i i basically just want to make music i don't want to have to think about all the the other stuff and like in the, i think in the old old fashioned music industry model that was kind of the way if you I suppose if you made it to a certain level you'd be able to just focus on the music you'd have a manager to take care of certain stuff you'd have a promotional team to take care of certain stuff and you know a lot of that will be paid for by the label you wouldn't have to fund that yourself whereas these days you kind of have to do everything yourself a lot of stuff out of your own pocket and it's like doing all that stuff is fine but then trying to find the time and the energy to be creative and to to be the most creative you can be to like really go deep into your music and craft it's harder and harder to find that time and then the music sort of ends up suffering because of it so it's just this sort of finding time and energy to do all the things you're kind of expected or to do as a, as a modern musician is really tough it's really challenging I, I don't know what the answer is I just just that's something that i i, I do sort of mm. yeah, find a challenge and struggle with and against uh, uh sometimes definitely i think yeah the um of, yeah the, the pandemic certainly changed loads of things but i i think i would agree like that the industry is changing very fast right now and there's a lot of things that are opening up and um, there's sort of like a bit of an uprising that obviously the major labels don't really want stuff to change. They want yeah. it to stay yeah. how it is. But there's a lot of I think there's a rising up, certainly in like the underground dance music, the underground music scene in general, not just dance music. The, um, it, yeah, the models and the paradigms that we're used to are not like they're not fair. And um, yeah, I think it is. I think you're right that. Yeah, there are there are avenues that people have got now to go down to be able to support themselves um completely and i also think just from my point of view on the software development side uh the same thing about most people who develop software are just happy to have like minimum wage just enough to live and be happy um rather than yeah shooting really really high and um putting a lot of pressure on yourself yeah i mean if you if you love your craft if if you love your craft you know and you're you're putting your heart and soul into it um 
you know, you're willing, you're willing to do it, but I don't, I think it's, yeah, it just needs to be, it just needs to be a living wage. You know, it, it just needs to be something that you're not demeaning people by offering them, you know, and I think, yeah, there has, I think there always has been part of the music industry that's been very predatory, but I do think, yeah, I, I think we, ha- we always have to be positive, you know, and I, I do always think, you know, new generations bring new energy and okay, you know, old footy duddies like me might be like, I don't understand some of this stuff, but you know, they, they'll come up with their own solution. And, you know, I, th- I thought the Twitch, Twitch model was kind of interesting there for a while. I was following that and some people doing stuff there. And then it'll, you know, before that, I suppose there was kind of like SoundCloud rappers. And it's interesting how the kind of software changes, how people uh, digest stuff and kind of how that affects the culture. And, and I think, yeah, the, the echoes of the pandemic will probably, probably rattle on for another while where we kind of see how it's you know we'll only in 10 years we'll probably still be analyzing how it changed how yeah. it changed things and, and you know, we, hopefully hopefully in a great way exactly it's certainly for things like live streaming and for ar shows vr yeah. shows like jean michel jar did a vr show didn't he um i know yeah. a lot of big artists doing augmented reality sort of stuff so i mean yeah ctm this year was amazing from from their point from that point of view of like they really just um yeah they they kind of really pushed it out there just kind of embraced the whole fully digital thing yeah had kind of games i know pussy crew and peaches did a really interesting thing together um well, yeah there's what been loads of, we we got they did a they did a game that's yeah um yeah peaches and they what's it called something naughty like fill your hole or something like that <laughs> but um but also yeah and then yeah we got to play a Ramwelton festival this year actually which was really interesting for us that we kind of tried to i did it built the av show in a in unreal engine and kind of tried to because ian was again out in, in the countryside in ireland i was here in the city in berlin and the show was somewhere else so we kind of tried to you know model the different places in 3d um put you know create different spaces and kind of that you could kind of walk between and you know so i think there is i think the a or v or side of it will will it'll it'll become another tool that that can be used you know i don't think i don't think everyone will be happy just to be getting kind of drunk in their bedroom for years and <laughs> looking at another another show you know <laughs> uh, everyone wants to get it back out and get sweaty obviously but i think now we see that there's you know a wednesday night screen rave maybe <laughs> might be the way you know to get you through and then saturday night you might go out on the weekend who knows you know so there's like yeah i think i think there is there there interesting things happening and there are possibilities within those definitely definitely and um yeah a lot of a lot of good like progressive change happening in in the right direction Mm. i think um it's interesting yeah that you pointed out about um the mental health with artists as well because you sort of as a as a singer songwriter you're you're like supposed to keep outputting your material at, at the same standard forever and that's sort yeah. of quite difficult and um yeah a friend of mine who uh it was a band manager and a dj manager for years um yeah he said that he's sort of trying to lobby for for labels to have like a wing where they they sort of train sort of training in mental health in some way i mean mental health is a bit of like a cliche term now and it's sort of it, it doesn't sort of feel nice to even say it i don't know it's like for me, it's a difficult, a difficult um, buzzword. You know, it's like you don't just want to pay it lip service and tick a box that says mental health is all good now. You know, um, but yeah. yeah, he said, he said, yeah, he he as a as a former band manager, he's now trying to get that side of it into running a label where they actually do look after the artist and the, what's good yeah. for the artist, and it's not just idea. think about the money that's coming in. Yeah. Great, great idea. Probably. Yeah, and I, I think it's something that probably sh- something that needs to be looked at from like booking p- booking agencies' point of view as well. You know, like I mean, I think if the Avicii thing showed us anything, it's just like, yeah, you know, it's important to have. You know, we're lucky. We're really happy with uh, our booking agent Brandon or whatever. He'll he never pushes us to do anything we don't want or anything like that. But I know there are some people out there who get pushed all the time and you know feel like get bullied into doing stuff and. Um, yeah, I think that's you know, especially if it's your only source of income, it can be there can be a lot of pressure there. But yeah, it can be hard. To yeah, there no, does need to be. There does need. It can be hard to say no to gigs and you know, 
you might have like yeah. you know four gigs back to back in, in a weekend or every weekend for for a while and that's really really tiring but it's really difficult to say no you know a, because yeah it, financially it's difficult but also because i think when you love doing something you really want to do it like i i love playing shows so i want to do more and more but it, yeah this, the, the the trade-off it's not always the healthiest thing to be have such a, a punishing schedule so yeah. yeah it's i think that's yeah it is a conversation that, that's happening isn't it though it's like it's more and more people are talking yeah about uh how important it is to look after <laughs> ourselves um in this industry so i think it, yeah we're kind of at the beginning that's a, I'd, I'd never heard of like a, a label setting up a sort of a specific wing of the label to, to deal with that i think it's a really positive idea i've had conversations with Mm. Uh, professionals yeah. in the sort of well-being and and mental health area who who would like to specifically work with musicians as well um because it's an area that is it's it's needed yeah it's like redundant in the music industry a little bit yeah because i suppose it still probably reeling from the old old-fashioned idea of like sex drugs and rock and roll that it was a cool thing but a lot of those people <laughs> that were really really miserable <laughs> and but i think people are kind of finally uh, kind of seeing that that's not not as attractive as it was once thought, <laughs> and that the reality of that is it, there's there's quite a lot of you know sadness and pain there. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. but also just to try and do ev- ev- everyone tries to do their own, everyone tries to do their own little piece as well. I mean, so if you see somebody struggling, you know, try and give them a call. You know, if if you if you have experience of touring and stuff like that, and you know how tough it can be, and you see somebody starting down that route, you know. Yeah, you know, just having kind of nice, trying to have conversations with people, and yeah, just kind of make connections that way. And just remember that your fellow musicians are, are what what keeps everything going as well. You know, it's important that you know, like I, I've you know, some of the people I've met touring have become really good friends of mine now. You know, and kind of you know, gotten to see some you know some of their personal lives and. Um, yeah, kind of some of the struggles some of them went through as well. So it's important to kind of try and maintain those friendships and uh, make you know meet up when you're sober, <laughs> and uh, rather than just yeah, because it was you know, and also it can happen in big cities. Like I, I, I used to meet people who lived here, and I just meet them at gigs, and I'd be like, oh, I live in Berlin as well. Let's meet up. And sometimes you don't, you know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's important to kind of try and push and just meet meet for a sober walk in the park, or you know, just kind of like. Yeah, just just see see if they're there, you know, see, be there for them if they need anything. Definitely. Genuine human connection, once again. Yeah, which... R- a r- ridiculous statement. <laughs> <laughs> as I said, as I said before we started recording, I did plan for this podcast to be always in person because I feel like there's a much better human connection. Um, but yeah, this yeah. is like, a, I guess, a positive side of the technologies that we can have this conversation being across across the globe. Um, had a number of releases on R and S, which is like an absolutely seminal record label. Yeah, yeah. How did that? How did that come about? And what? And what did that feel like when that started? And uh, that was that came about. What, what year did we? Maybe like 2013 or so. We, we first released with them. Um, it came about because I think they had heard the stuff we'd released with Stroboscopic Artifacts. We'd done like two EPs there, and the A and R guy at the time, Sam, really liked them. And he basically just got in touch. I think he, he fired an email across saying, would you be interested in sending a demo over to Orness? So we were like, yep, <laughs> let's do it. Um, so we did. We sent, sent some tracks. They liked pretty much all of them. And then, yeah, from that came conversations and then some EPs. And I think oh, we did like three EPs and three albums really with them um, over the course of the, of the last nice. few years. Um, so, yeah, it, it was a great label for us to be with uh, for, for that many years. Um, and we got a lot, of, a lot of amazing experiences from it and we released lots of music um, but we decided to call it a day at the end of 2019 so we're, we're currently not with RNS anymore we're searching for a new label there's a few few sort of reasons and issues that we decided to kind of call, call it quits but for the time we were there it was a very positive experience for us um, and yeah really happy with the music that we put out on, on RNS records and now we're kind of in, in, the, in the process of writing loads of new tracks, exploring different sounds and making new stuff. Kind of, there's, a, there's a freshness back again. Um, that 
freshness that can kind of come when you kind of close one chapter, you know, you kind of go, okay, that's, that's done. And we're kind of looking for something, something else and something new. Um, uh, so that's kind of where we're at now. We're kind of working on a, a huge bunch of new material and then we're going to find a new home for it when it's, when it's ready. Yeah. I think even in terms of the, the sounds of the last of Epoca and stuff, that was kind of the, the, in some ways I can still can kind of consider it our pop album <laughs> because it was kind of, you know, <laughs> there was like some vocally stuff on it, you know, um, and all that, but you know, that we kind of, yeah, pushed it in, in that direction. There was kind of a lot of found sound, you know, as well, very kind of, it was more, maybe a little bit more organic sounding, but I think recently, you know, we've just been having so much fun just writing, you know, just like f- dance, Dan- I don't like to use the word dance floor, but just fun, fun music, just kind of getting back into it. You know, it takes a while once you're finished an album to kind of go through the, you know, there's a whole process of promotion and, you know, then kind of touring and all this sort of stuff. And then we did a kind of remix album, a pocket dubbed, where we kind of just um, with our friend, uh, we used our friend Chris Jarman's studio and kind of um, just kind of dubbed the album out. And so then once we were finished with that, we we're like, okay, we have a totally blank slate now. What are we going to do? And um, yeah, we kind of, we, we found these old tracks um, that we'd released years ago as kind of this like lacquer rave system kind of offshoot thing that we'd done, which were like kind of like crazy break core kind of gaba sort of stuff. And we listened to those and we were like, let's just write some, let's just write some fun kind of, let's just write some, you know, fun stuff, nothing too serious. And then from that, that kind of gave us the seed ideas of, of some new stuff that we're working on at the minute. So yeah, we're just, we're probably, hopefully we'll be finished. We, we have, we have our folder now of finished tracks and it's nearly, uh, we, we have a few tracks in there. And so I'd say within the next month or so, we'll be sending, uh, some stuff off and kind of, yeah, start, starting, uh, starting again. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Good, That's really exciting. Good. Uh, freshness and sort of like not restarting but that that kind of idea as Dara said yeah just the new yeah. sort of next next chapter kind of thing because I think yeah as you said Epoca kind of was the final sort of uh, the final part of a certain type of sound we were making a certain ex- exploration of sound and I kind of finished that off and now it's like yeah the next thing which is I think nice. we've probably done that a few times through through the years we've been together it's kind of worked on a certain thing got to a place that we're kind of happy that we we've explored all we want to explore in that and then sort of start again with a, a new or it might not be a massively different sound but sort of new to us anyway um or sort of yeah. fresh to us so that that seems to be a pattern we go through do something for a while then stop something else stop something else it's all part of the the trajectory if we're not shit there's a big there's a big thunderstorm happening here so it's just a big flash <laughs> of lightning i'm looking at all my computer stuff plugged in get the uh, <laughs> get the recorder out Record some of that thunder. Get the power surge. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hopefully, um, it, I I love when I love when there's a thunderstorm. Or if I if I've got my portable recorder anywhere nearby, I always just stick it out the window. Yeah. You know, yeah, sample, always great kinds of stupid stuff. But yeah, that's great. And obviously, yeah, I really really enjoy your music, and I know a lot of people do. Um, really looking forward to hearing some some new stuff as well as still enjoying the old stuff. You know, it's Thank not you. always. It's, I'm I'm quite. Uh, yeah, conscious of like enjoying what's already been made, you know, you don't, we're not yeah, necessarily yeah. getting obsessed with everything new. That's a very um, good point. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> very much appreciated. Yeah, because there's plenty of people there whose, whose old music still getting into, people who are releasing lots of great new music, but there's so much stuff there that you still <laughs> is worthwhile. It can be so easy to get distracted yeah. by constant new things because there's so much of it at the moment that to, uh, yeah, listen to people's. Exactly. Isn't it people's back catalogs as well? Because there's always going to be diamonds in there. Definitely. There was, ah, oh, there's, I've been listening to a bit of iMonster, who are a little duo, electronic duo. They just recently did a documentary called Bright Sparks with a guy called Dave Spears. It's like a synth documentary going through some of the classic synths and, and the people behind them. And yeah, from watching that documentary, I went back through their catalog and I was like, wow, I love this stuff. And um, yeah, exactly. It's fine. It's good stuff yeah. everywhere, isn't there? For sure. Cool. Just a couple more questions. Cool. Just a couple more questions, if that's okay. Um, just in yeah. terms of like mentors in your lives, have you have you had any mentors, any people that have come and helped you along the way that stand out? Uh, for me, not to be too gushy, but Dara's definitely been one of them. 
Um, just as I said, like he, he taught me music production early on, uh, taught me the techniques and imparted his sort of his knowledge and passion for the, the sound. So definitely that was one sort of very direct and <laughs> personal <laughs> mentor for me. Um, also, my, my, my stepfather, who I lived with for many years, uh, is a classical music composer. So he was another very direct mentor. He actually sat me down and taught me taught me piano and he taught me um, like sort of composition lessons in terms of like, you know, sitting down with a pencil and, and paper and com- wow. composing in that. And also then sort of or- orchestra. Um, which gives you amazing insight when it comes to mixing tracks because it's just the sort of same thing, you know, I had to, had to get the textures and the colors by balancing the different el- elements. So it was really cool to get an experience of that in the sort of traditional orchestral world and then to be able to do it in electronic music as well. There's, you know, very clear parallels between the two. Um, so, yeah, they're, Absolutely. they're my two, two mentors. <laughs> Much indebted to both. Yeah, I suppose I, I was the same as well. Like Ian showed me, you know, probably a more the, a more, the more musical side of of stuff, and um, I probably would have been more technical at the start. And then, yeah, just kind of yeah, music theory and stuff like that. It's always, you know, always always useful to know music theory when you're writing music. <laughs> um, but also then, yeah, when I went and did my course in sound engineering, that was like really. I had an amazing uh, teacher, Larry O'Toole, who was like, uh, just, you know, one of those people who just by virtue of the fact that they're into such interesting stuff and have such a depth of knowledge are just inspiring. Um, even if, even if they don't, even if you don't have a huge amount of interaction with them, like he was one of my lecturers, but also just, yeah, like listen to him talk about even, you know, a little, he'd be like, oh, at the, here they're doing this sort of stuff. And and then that would get you excited about it. And it kind of, you know, o- always leading you on. I think co- college is good like that. You know, there, there are many problems with the education system and, you know, you can learn so much stuff online. But one of, you know, one of the main things is just, yeah, access to lecturers who are doing interesting stuff and kind of, you know, inspiring about what you know what what's happening there actually the when i went to um when i went to to the open day for the college it was senior college ballet ferment when i went to the open day for it there was um this young guy in the studio um and he was just blasting out the craziest music i'd ever heard he had it insanely loud and years la- or later i discovered it was this irish producer called anodyne colin clockley just had a new EP. And he, he had he had fame yeah yeah, he'd famously blown one of the NS10s in the studio, like one of the good monitors or one of, one of the monitors by just playing stuff too loud. But he was like, it it was really just, you know, when something comes along that's like new music that you just haven't a clue what it is and it's so inspiring and it's like wh- a totally new sound. So that that was that was kind of good for me. And then one of my mom's friends was an artist who... Uh, my mom used to work for this guy who had a fish farm and it was kind of a very, you know, uh, kind of new age hippie style, kind of had loads of, you know, had a research center and was really interesting guy, you know. And yeah, through some of his friends, then they kind of introduced me to people who did visuals and c- kind of gave me, you know, Cubase and all this sort of stuff. So, yeah, just the the kind of human Google, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just just meeting interesting people and picking their brains and kind of you know and it's still i still think about that actually i you know i still like to call it the human google like you'll never for me you know it's it's it is amazing that we can watch tutorials and stuff like that and you know you can teach yourself so much stuff like that but sometimes just like some personalized time with somebody in a studio just sharing sharing their ideas and sharing link or sharing you know stuff that that they're into and like bits of knowledge and stuff like that is still the, the speed at which you can learn when you meet somebody, when you meet the right person is just, it's just incredible because, you know, when, when you're trying to Google something or, or you're looking through YouTube, sometimes, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to, you're trying to type in the right words or you're not, you know, you're not understanding something or, but when you're, when you're face to face with somebody, you can just, uh, you can just say, okay, this is what I know. This is what I don't know. I, I'm missing a very basic part of my knowledge here and then some bits up here and there and they just go, okay, this is it. Boom, 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 boom. And it's so fast, you know? Yeah. So 
that's the thing that there's no there's no replacement for that being in the room with somebody like like you said it doesn't even have to be like a direct somebody showing you something just being around someone who's passionate dedicated and inspired by what they do can teach you so much and inspire mm. you so much just even just watching yeah. someone how, how they uh, how they do what they do is like can be super uh, inspiring in that way and and just on that as well you're talking about being in the studio dara i i, I find that i learn a lot uh, from doing collaborations, everyone I collaborate with is like a mentor as well. I do do, do a lot of collaborations. I re- really enjoy the the process. A lot of the time, it's online now, which is unfortunate because when you're in the studio with someone, it's also I do enjoy the online collaboration. It's a different thing, but um, when you're in the studio with someone, just watch, not even them showing, just watching what somebody does is is always super inspiring. You, you learn so much, um, and a lot of the time, it's watching. You use the same tools, like just how, how different people use Ableton. That's what, what, what I use. That's what we use for the lacquer stuff. Ways of thinking, yeah. Yeah, just people approach it so differently and do thing, things you would never think of using this same tool that you use every day. And that I find that amazing. And it's like kind of, yeah, just constantly always inspiring. And I always learn at least one really cool and useful new thing from a collaboration. Usually many more, but there's always one thing I'm like, ooh, I can I can use that. I never thought that way before. But also, Definitely. like that's it's it's good that you say that because it was actually you your work with Kioka yeah. was I found I found it inspiring. I wasn't even there, <laughs> but from what you were telling me about the way she thinks about oh, things and just the way she uses yeah. di- di- different systems, and I was like, okay, that's interesting. And I did I I just was in the studio with um, Born in Flames once as well, and. Just her approach. I was like, okay, I wouldn't do it like that. And then I was like, actually, that's kind of an interesting way to to work at things, you know. And I think it's always important to see. And it's the same when we were over with Kamikaze Space Program, uh, Chris Jarman, his studio, and he's a very kind of, uh, you know, he has his own kind of uh, um, way of approaching things. And yeah, it's really inspiring. Then you're just like, okay, yeah, maybe I can incorporate a little bit of that, or you know, even just. Yeah, people's approaches to things and the way they think. And some people are just really, some people's thought process itself is just really interesting. You know, when you meet somebody yeah, yeah. who's like a genuinely different character and you're just like, I haven't a fucking clue what this person's thinking about or why <laughs> yeah. they're thinking about it that way. But it's so bizarre to me that it's it's even just inspiring to be around. They don't even, even yeah. they could be a poet, they could be a landscape gardener. It doesn't matter, you know, just somebody who really thinks outside the box and you're like, okay, yeah, that's super yeah. inspiring. It's just like that thing of being being around and open to people who have totally different perspectives to you. You're like, wow, yeah, it is. It's yeah. uh, it's a lot to be learned. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. And um, I know people like talking about star quality. You know, people who have got star quality. Um, you, sort of, you people you meet ran, like you say like landscape gardener you know you, you meet sort of other people all around your life don't you that have got the star quality but they're not like a superstar but they're just like this yeah, yeah. this really have this amazing energy you know yeah. yeah totally and that thing of like watching anyone who's really good at something it doesn't not matter what the thing is if they're really proficient in it and really like dedicated and passionate it, it's so inspiring to see it could be just like you know baking a cake or something but it's like when you see someone who's amazing at something, it's it's so inspiring. You're like, wow. I suppose it shows you the potential of what what people you're like, oh wow, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I guess yeah, you're right. They sort of show you what is possible, sort of expands yeah. you realise that yeah, you're able to do that. And um yeah. yeah, those all those all those production techniques that someone I remember somebody compressed one of my bass lines more on the chorus than on the verse. There was like a, they made a separate track for it. I was like, yeah. "Fuck, that's such a good idea!" Like a different <laughs> track for the compression on the chorus, that, and it was like a pop track. It wasn't, you know, it was. Yeah. It, was it had to sort of fit those formulas. But yeah, I always just remember, like, "Fuck, I would never have thought of doing that." Yeah, yeah, it's amazing because it can be like that. It can be quite a simple thing, and you just go, "Wow, that I would never think of doing that," and it really changes how I approach or think about this now. And it's just like something small. It's fascinating. Definitely. Great. Well, um, it's been really great to speak to you guys. Thank you so much for um, for taking the time to talk to me. Not at all. It's been really enjoyable. Thanks for thanks for having us. Yeah, I hope we I hope we didn't waffle on too much. You got t- two Irish guys who've been trapped in the house for a while. There's going to be there's going to be a lot of talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's great, man. It's absolutely perfect. Thank you so much. It's been great to speak to cool. you. Yeah. Well, dude. Thanks. Oh, it was really good to speak to the lads. They were really friendly, um, really thoughtful, and also really funny as well. Uh, that was a really good laugh. Um, we did all do that from three separate locations, as you might have heard. So, um, 
logistically it was it was a, it was a fun one um, but yeah really amazing guys do check out their music check out the documentary that they did and um, yeah buy their tunes because they're fucking amazing okay on the show next time we've got a huge artist one of my all-time heroes we've got cj bolland on the show uh, in a couple of weeks uh absolute techno legend known for some seminal tracks still making music today really looking forward to getting that one out there you can donate to the podcast i do it all by myself if you want to donate it's greatly appreciated if you don't want to just like and share and tell your friends about it that would be appreciated Thank you once again for listening. Look after each other. I'm Midiera and I'll see you soon.